Can you can you just say hello to the audience? Can you just say hello to the audience for us. Sure. We're on the Cordano podcast, Francais. Right. Oh, yeah, for the all French, the French speaking. French. Uh, French. I'm, I'm afraid my French is terrible. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm terribly sorry. Why can't you say in French? <laughs> no, no. I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> no, but these words. Bon no, appetit. It's <laughs> like a, a Southern American thing. What is it? Je ne parle pas de français. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's good. Great. Yeah. That's great. That's great. <laughs> that's good. Uh, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour. Uh, right. That's. that's I, and I can boof. Uh, <laughs> I, I try the Gallic shrug, yeah. Yeah. but no, I shouldn't insult everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but wait, yo, let, go, ahead. go No, no, go ahead. We enjoyed your talk today. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yes. Good. It was very good. I, tr I tried to make things comprehensible. Yes. Because um, you know, not everybody understands the hard stuff. You know. Also um, charismatic. Yeah. I, I found. Uh, yeah. You're too nice. In particular, one part funny. Um, yeah. Duncan yeah. was saying if uh, the issues that we're solving at IOHK don't keep you up at night, then you probably don't understand them. Yes. <laughs> and that means I don't understand them because I sleep eight hours a night. <laughs> no, that's true. And uh, for, for some who, uh, who are really going deep into the technology, you never go as deep as this guy. So, uh, <laughs> well, there's a whole team behind me, right? It's not just me, right? Like, you know, I, I'm just the front guy. Uh, yeah. But there's there's a whole team who are, you know, really doing all the hard technical stuff. And yeah, there's the real mathematics. There's the real, you know, all the stuff we show you on the slides is like, you know, it's a little flavor, but it's proper mathematics, set theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we've done internal reviews where we go through the whole stuff and explain it to everybody and review it and say, is that really what we mean? Is that what we want? You know, it's not just a set of rules, but is it the rules that we want, what, we, what our real intention is. And that's really amazing because when you, when you watch your presentation, you see that it's clear you can make a mistake because you, 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 you go from the mathematics, the formula, you go for... Well, mul yes uh, no. No? Right? So, so once we've decided what we want, we can establish that we've not made a mistake against what we want. But establishing what we want, establishing our intention, That, that itself is hard. Yeah. Like how, do, how do you know that what you've written down is what you really want? And that's why it's so important that we do this, uh, this formal approach in a way that's comprehensible to people. Yeah, right? yeah. So Charles can understand our you know, formal mathematical description, right? And Agalos and the other researchers. And we can say, not only is that a self-consistent piece of mathematics, which I can check or any mathematician can check, But it's the piece of mathematics that we actually want. Yeah. That it describes the system that we intend. Right? So, you know, I, I can have a team that can check that given what we want, that that's what we've implemented, but what is it that we wanted? Yeah. And that bit requires real understanding. But the formal methods help you to... The formal to methods get you from here to there yeah. without making a mistake. Yeah, wait, but yeah. you can make a mistake at the level of the specification. Yeah, of course. Of which course. is why it's so important we try to make our specifications understandable, yeah. comprehensible to people, yeah. concise, so that you can actually fit it in your head, mm -hmm. so that many people can fit it in their heads. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that Charles can read it and say, you know, Charles is a mathematician, but he's not you know, the same kind of computer scientist that me and the rest of the team are. But he can read those rules and say, yes, I understand that. And yes, that is what I mean. That is what I want. Okay. So that you know, we can connect what Charles wants through to what our code does. Mm -hmm. But that that specification part is really important, and that's why we've put so much effort into it, and that's why we published it, um, published all our specifications for everybody to read, for them to see, you know, what is our intention, and for them to go, maybe you've made a mistake, and you know, they can tell us, uh, and then you know, we can just dis discuss it, mm -hmm. because it's in set theory is a very common mathematical. You know, everyone who does undergraduate mathematics. You know, understand set theory and logic and this kind of notation. So that's why we've, we've deliberately tried to make it a very accessible, at least, you know, accessible to kind of the mathematical um, sort of people. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, how closely do you communicate with the formal methods team, like Jared and Philip? Oh, it, oh we're like it? we're constantly, constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, like okay. Philip and I work very, very closely together. Okay. And okay. we're working with with that rest of that formal methods team okay. all the time. Okay. Yeah, so like Jared and Damien and all the rest of them and I and, and Philip are you know, talking all the time. It's like, well, what do we want here? What do we mean here? Mm -hmm. How do we turn that into a formal description? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a question for Duncan. Um, you're, you were speaking about how establishing what you want can sometimes be the most difficult part. Yes. And I see that... Being, the, being the, precise about what you want. Being, yeah. being precise. So... 
if you take it uh, to a more generalized level, the, the end goal of the product is to solve real world problems. So as a product that has never been created before, how does that tie into the low level work that you're doing? Does that make it more difficult or does that seem like a background issue that is too generalized and you don't actually touch that sort of thing? There's quite a few sort of stages of translation between like, you know, what is useful to the end user through to, okay, well, what do you want the system to do? And I, I guess a lot of that actually comes from Charles, right? So Charles has an idea about what is it he wants to build and what is it that he believes that the users really want. And, and he does quite a lot of the, all right, so I think I know what the users want, Charles says, and then he turns it into, okay, Duncan, Philip, this is, this is what I want. And then we, and, and with the other researchers, we go through and, and then we try to write down what we believe Charles has said in this formal way. And then we present it back to him and say, Charles, is this what you meant? And he says, yes, 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 yes. No, that bin needs to be slightly different. Okay. Yes, 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 no, tweak until we're happy with it. And those specifications are what we've been public, what we published on the blog uh, the day before the conference. Super interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, you know, I'm not a product guy. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not the, the, I don't do the you know, market analysis of what is it that people really want. I think that's too much to have in one person, but it's a, it's a, a, a group of people mm -hmm. and a few stages of translation to get from what is it the users really want, what is it that, that's going to be valuable into, okay, how do we formalize that? How do we turn that into a precise description of our intention right. and then you know there's a sort of more mechanical mm -hmm. I mean hard technically but more mechanical process to get through from all right now we know now we've captured our intention formally precisely mm -hmm. concisely through to the code does you know what our intention you know we have evidence that connects our code with our intention mm -hmm. yeah. after a, a formal specification is created do you create a proof and uh, test the proof using Haskell, or can it also be done using Rust? Oh, it can be done with for Rust. Yeah, yeah. So there's nothing that's really special about Haskell in this context. So we, we agree what our formal specification is, uh, and we go through rounds of review internally, and then we go through rounds of review with Charles and Aglas and other researchers. Um, and once we say, you know, these are the specifications we want, in parallel, we've been developing the executable specification, which matches up with that. And you know, we can check, we don't need Charles to check that, we can check that, that those two match up against each other. We need Charles to check our intention, that, you know, but once we've got to that, then the, 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 the executable specification, we can check that those are equivalent. Um, and then we can use that, that executable specification both to check our Haskell implementation, but we can also use it to check any other implementation. Right? Okay. Because we have generators that generate random, uh, systematically random, arbitrary uh, example chains, ledgers, and we use that as an input to compare any implementation against the executable specification. Now, of course, we've designed that to be most, you know, it's easier to do in Haskell, mm -hmm. because both of those implementations are in Haskell. But there's nothing that stops any, any third party that wants to create their own implementation of Cardano, mm -hmm. they can use our generators and our executable specifications mm -hmm. as a as a reference test oracle uh, to check their implementation is right and and we can do that for the rust implementation too okay yeah. and here here's just one question i'm personally curious about but the the listeners might also want to know so when you say that something not you in particular but at, at the conference we've heard a lot about uh, formal specifications being as close to proof as we as we can come um, before creating a product and, and feeling confident that it will behave as described in the specification. So, um, for instance, how would you represent something like a string in math? How, how, does, how does that bridge get, get crossed? Because when you have a programming language, you have different... A string is a sequence of characters. And so how would you represent that in...? Uh, the notion of a sequence is a perfectly reasonable mathematical object. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can represent strings in, in mathematics very straightforwardly. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I would just pick up on one thing. I mean, I, you, you said that, uh, you know, that testing is the sort of the best thing you can... Well, it's, it's not the best thing you can achieve. We can achieve one level higher. Mm -hmm. We can go to full, full formal mathematical proof. And we have not done that yet for for everything, 
but we are working on that for certain bits. Right, so for the Shelly implementation, we are relying on, on testing, uh, testing against our specification. But that's not the end of our ambition. You know, we can go, we can go to closer to the gold standard of full formal mathematical proof. And we have done that already in a couple of little areas. And there's others that are in progress. So we have done that uh, in certain aspects of the Plutus core implementation. You know, we, have, we have proofs in the Agda programming language slash theorem prover. Um, and we are working on other proofs for other parts of the system, but they, they're not going to be ready yet for Shelley. So Shelley relies, the, the evidence that we have for assurance in Shelley is testing evidence, but over time we can, we can do more and more and higher levels of quality of assurance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have that ambition. So testing is not the end of the story, mm. um, but it's the easiest one to get start with. So, so that's why we're doing that first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good questions, Marcus. And I have yeah, one more question. Yeah, yeah. um, is it possible to create a formal spec f um, for, for a program that is written in something like JavaScript? Yes, because the specification is independent of the language. But it's much, much harder to connect the JavaScript implementation against that formal specification. And why is that? Because JavaScript has a semantics which had to be reverse engineered. Right? So JavaScript was written as a thing, and then people tried to describe it mathematically. So JavaScript was not designed to have a simple formal specification, whereas languages like Haskell or Agda or, um, or proper theorem provers like, mm -hmm. uh, like Koch or like um, Isabel you know, were designed to have a mathematical mm -hmm. semantics, mm -hmm. and JavaScript was never designed to have a mathematical semantics. It was designed just to be a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, an engineering artifact, and you know it was designed to be easy to use or whatever, but it was not designed to have a really clear, simple mathematical explanation. So it does have a mathematical explanation, but it's about this big, whereas like you know the mathematical specification of mathematical languages is is concise. Mm -hmm. Right. So and that's when why you... Plutus can fit on a napkin. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So Plutus is the result. So Plutus core is just taking something that's like. 30 years old from academia and, and that's already been really understood in research and saying let's take that as our core language and use that as our and then we write an interpreter for that so it's already something which was distilled down to the simplest possible thing whereas yeah like javascript java c c++ all these mainstream languages were designed as kind of engineering things but not as they weren't the, the design of the language is not optimized to give you a simple semantics, a simple mathematical semantics. Mm -hmm. Whereas Plutus Core, very straightforwardly was, Haskell, you know, more so, but not, not, as, not as extremely as Plutus Core. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most difficult part for me conceptually is my, my lack of understanding of the actual mathematic the mathematical mathematical objects that represent uh, aspects of the programming languages. So the way For you think instance, about it is you, like this, right? You explained a string as a sequence of numbers. Are these like the bits that compose the string in memory? No, no. What, what is a string abstractly? It is a sequence, an ordered sequence mm -hmm. of characters. And what is a character? You can represent it well. Let's say Unicode. They're just Unicode numbers. So, you know, A is whatever it is, okay. 43 or whatever it is. I can't so remember. If you have like a definition of what each character is and numbers, then you could create a set of rules to represent a string. It's not even a set of rules. The notion of a sequence is already a perfectly well defined mathematical thing. Just like the, the notion of a set is a. I mean, a set is an even simpler mathematical thing. A list or a sequence is a slightly more complicated mathematical concept, but not very much more. So you can say that you can say that mathematically a string is just a sequence of characters, and that's a perfectly reasonable abstract definition. Okay. So the way I would say about about language semantics is that if you have a language where you you optimize, you iterate the language design, looking at its formal semantics, you end up making a language which is simpler and simpler and simpler, for or rather the the, the formal semantics of that language become simpler and simpler because that's what you're optimizing for. Whereas if you take a language which was designed without that sort of process, well, of course, your mathematical description is going to be very complex because you've not followed a process of trying to 
optimize, 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 optimize for the simplicity of its formal, formal semantics. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of stands, it's very obvious in some sense as to why like languages which are designed to have a simple formal semantics have a simple formal semantics. And languages which never intended to have a simple formal semantics don't have a simple formal semantics. It's just, it's just a matter of how they were designed. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think JavaScript just solved a specific problem. Right. Which you is, uh, and that's no criticism. No criticism of the Netscape right. guys. Yeah. You know, they were trying to solve a particular problem. They weren't trying to. Um, they were, and, and they were trying to do it quickly as well. I think where I would have more of a criticism is like the EVM. Right. So the EVM, I look at it as a as a someone with a background in programming language design. And I say that system, the, the like the languages that compile into the EVM, they don't appear to have benefited at all from the last thirty years of programming language research. They're just doing a thing, rather than saying like, let's take all these great ideas yeah. and and use that to inform the way that we design the language, which was clearly available at the time it was being implemented. Yeah, and okay, you know, you can't criticize the people who did it. You know, they weren't necessarily programming language researchers. Oh, but right. one of the advantages that we have is that we know that you need all these different disciplines yeah. to be able to build a, new, a really good system. You need macroeconomics experts, you need programming language experts, you need game theory experts, you need cryptography experts. We know you need all those things, and so we've tried to gather all those people together to, to apply all those different disciplines to tackle the different aspects of the problem. Whereas, yeah, no, you know, I don't want to beat up on the Ethereum guys, but they, they were trying to do something quickly with the people that they had. Mm -hmm and then that's what they built. And maybe we wouldn't exist as a company without their presidents. Exactly. Sure. You've got to do things the first time before you do things the second time or the third time, you know. You know. And that's what that's the experience that Charles had and that's what that's the, the lesson that Charles drew. And so that's why he gathered together all these all this multidisciplinary team. Right. Because he could see that it's a multidisciplinary problem. The dream team like he called it. It certainly is like I, I feel as if I'm learning all the time um, just by being part of the team and keeping up with the project, like I work on the Daedalus UI, so I'm writing JavaScript all the time, and my interest no in functional criticism. language. No, no, no criticism in the JavaScript. <laughs> no, I, I've become uh, increasingly interested in learning more about functional languages because I increasingly see the, the benefits. And maybe a lot of the headaches I go through during my, my work could be alleviated in some way by yeah. using, I, I would, using so I, type languages. I would yeah. encourage everyone to watch the uh, recording of the uh, Ethiopian uh, education talk mm -hmm. that we had uh, at the conference today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because that was describing how um, the, 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 the course that we ran in Ethiopia, teaching Haskell, teaching Plutus, mm -hmm. and the experience that the students there had. Because I mean, what you just said is, you know, um, they, they, they felt that they got really a lot out of that. Um, you know, they had been, they had been using mainstream languages mm -hmm. on their computer science degrees in Ethiopia, or you know, in, in industry in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and and doing functional programming with Haskell was like an eye-opening experience to them, uh, as it was to me when I went to university. You know, it's nothing about it being you know one country or another. It's just like being exposed to the ideas for the first time, yeah. um, and it's like, wow. I, I've taken a couple Rust courses online just in my free time, and I, I can say that. Uh, having done a, a few years of JavaScript and then learning Rust, R Rust feels more like the way code was meant to be written. And so I Rust, can't tell you why, it just Rust feels way more natural. Yeah. yeah. So Rust definitely picks up on ideas from computer science from the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. you know? it, it's an imperative language, but it really picks up on the type system ideas. Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, it's a bit more functional. No, no Rust is not a functional language. It's a very much an imperative language. It's, it's like C, but it does take ideas that came out of the functional programming community about type systems to make your programs more reliable and not have the kind of memory errors that C tends to have. So it's you know Rust is a good language. It's a, it's, it's a squarely imperative systems programming language, but it really does pick up on research ideas, well you know well used ideas now right, that have been demonstrated in practice in other areas mm -hmm. and applies them to system programming. Um, so, so, so what makes a language functional versus imperative? Uh, how long have we got? <laughs> might, this might take a little while. I'm going to leave you the mic <laughs> so you can tell as long as you want. <laughs> see, see, I knew JavaScript is an imperative language. Yeah. And when I was studying Rust, I thought I was studying functional programming. <laughs> 
So the, the, the key, the key characteristic, really <laughs> the key difference is this, right? So imperative programming says, do this, do that, do the next thing, go back and do it again, right? It's yeah. about state, state transitions, changing mutable variables, and loops, and like imperative, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a functional style is more like a spreadsheet, right? So in a spreadsheet, forget about the fact that it's two-dimensional. Think about the fact that it is a set of mutually recursive equations. Each cell is a, an expression. It's an expression which may refer to other expressions. Mm -hmm. And you, in, an, in a spreadsheet, there's no notion of the order in which things are evaluated. They're simply evaluated in the right order to give the right answer. Right? So there's no, there's no sequencing of do this, do that, do the next thing. The spreadsheet figures out the right order to do the calculations in to produce the right answer. And that's what functional programming is like. So, so is the program not executed uh, based on the line order? No. It's not? No. It's based on the order that you need to evaluate the answer, just mm. like a spreadsheet. So, you know, spreadsheets are not evaluated top down, left to right. They're evaluated in the right order, whatever that is. Mm. And which order that is depends on how you write your expressions in your spreadsheet. But that doesn't matter. That's not something you have to think about. You see, the spreadsheet simply states what is the answer, mm. what is the right value, what's the calculation that I want, and the system evaluates it, executes it, correctly. So is there not an entry point to the program? There's like a top would you, level would you invoke a function yeah. and that's the entry point? Yeah, so the, the, the top level of your program is the thing that you do to calculate the overall thing you want to do, uh, which sometimes is, is a sequence of an imperative effect, but it, it involves lots and lots of calculations of, of values. So a spreadsheet's a really good analogy. And are they all nested together? Ultimately, it's one big expression that calls other expressions that calls other expressions, like, mm. like a spreadsheet. You know, if you want to know the answer in one cell, mm -hmm. it may depend on oh, yeah. okay. sort of everything else. Yeah. Right, OK. That makes sense. It's, but, it, but it's written as a text file, not as a two-dimensional grid. Mm -hmm. But technically speaking, it's a slightly strange analogy, but technically speaking, a spreadsheet is what we would call a zeroth order functional programming language. Right, zeroth, where, order. zeroth order, whereas we write higher order of functional programs. Mm -hmm. right, in, a, in, a, in a cell, you can only have a value. We can have functions as well, and functions of functions, and, and so we, it's much more, much more right. uh, powerful. And we don't just have, you know, numbers and dates and currency values as our types. We have sophisticated data types. But the the fundamental notion is actually much more like a spreadsheet than it is like a do this, do that, do the next thing. And a higher order function is basically f of g of x. Higher order functions are functions that take other functions as inputs uh -huh. or return other functions as outputs. So where the values that you manipulate can themselves be functions. And that turns out to be much more useful than it might sound at first. Uh, it allows a whole other degree of abstraction. And the big thing about software engineering is abstraction and composition. Mm -hmm. You build big systems by composing small systems and you make code reusable by abstracting over different details and then instantiating that in multiple different ways. That's how you get code reuse. So people think about polymorphism in, in OO languages. We have a different notion of polymorphism, but it's the same fundamental idea, which is it allows you to get code reuse mm -hmm. by using the same code many times in many different contexts. And this saves on many developer hours and the pain of rewriting it mm -hmm. as, as a developer. Yeah. You know, I can say that's I mean, painful. Code reuse you know, yeah, has everything. the advantages that code reuse has. It's, it's very, very important. Right. And we just do it in a slightly different way. Well, thank you, Duncan. Uh, thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Duncan. I, I kind of took that on yeah, a, we had, uh, <laughs> a train ride. We, we, we kept you for longer than we went to the right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Nice, uh, nice talk to you. Merci thank à you. tout le monde. Au revoir. Okay. okay. <laughs>